thank you very much for inviting me to participate in the 80th Scientific Annual Meeting of the Japan Neurosurgical Society. Thank you to President uh, Professor Kinouchi for his kind invitation. It is my pleasure, my honor to be with you today. I deeply admire the professionalism and the very high standards of Japanese neurosurgery where I have many colleagues and friends. So I hope uh, you enjoy my uh, lecture. And I wanted to share with you some of the latest innovations in endoscopic endonasal skull-based surgery. Um, as many of you know, uh, I'm deeply influenced by my mentors, Professor Roton and his deep expertise in surgical anatomy, Professor Kassam and his innovative surgical technique. And I've been trying over the last decade to continue their legacy, continue building upon their um, advancements to continue pro the progression of the endonasal endoscopic skull surgery field. I work at Stanford uh, Hospital in the Bay Area in Northern uh, California. I have a phenomenal team that works with me. As you know, skull surgery is very much about teamwork. And I wanna emphasize the importance of having excellent collaborators to the best outcome for our patients. These are my conflict of interest and they are actually relevant to this talk. These are dissectors I've, I've developed. The latest one is this uh, from Hotry. And these are instruments that I believe are so important for our operations. Um, and you will see them being used throughout uh, my presentation. You've heard before how we describe the anatomy of the middle wall of the cavernous sinus and the anatomy of the ligaments that anchor this middle wall of the cavernous sinus. And I want to show you some new developments here. Um, remember how we talk about the corridoclinoidal ligament, the CCL that forms the roof of the cavernous sinus. And it separates actually the cavernous sinus here in blue from the clinoidal space just above the cavernous sinus. The CCL is the ventral uh, proximal dural ring. And you see this beautiful illustration. And I've been working lately with a phenomenal illustrator trying to make easier to understand the surgical anatomy we need, we need to learn for our endoscopic endonasal approaches. And here you can see um, the, uh, C the corridocronal ligament, the CCL right here. And above we have the, what we call the dorsal clinoidal space. There is a ventral clinoidal space that is in this direction, ventral to the carotid towards the enteroclinoid process. There is a dorsal clinoidal space above the cavernous sinus, behind and medial to the carotid. And tumors can spread both ways. And it's important to understand this differentiation. Also remember the inferior paracellar ligament, the one that is gonna be give us access to the posterior clinoid behind, and where we find in our way, the inferior hypophyseal artery. So this picture, this illustration, summarizes a lot of the key anatomy we need to understand when we do these resections in the cavernous sinus area. And again, this new concept of the clinoidal space, in particular what we call the dorsal or medial clinoidal space, uh, differentiating it from the ventral or lateral one, which is the one we expose usually through a clinoidectomy, uh, through an open approach. And here you can see this view is from behind. And in this view, you can see the distal ring, the proximal ring or CCL, you see the CCL forming part of the distal ring, this is the pituitary gland and the medial wall, we're looking inside the cavern of sinus, and we can see the ventral clinoidal space, optic strata, and clinoidal, clinoidal uh, um, anterior clinoidal process, where tumors can extend uh, from anterior or from ventral, but also from dorsal. Tumors can extend in this direction into the dorsal clinoidal space. So, so important to understand both. And I'll show you some examples. Um, we're also trying to um, um, make our technique of the middle wall resection more feasible and more attainable by other surgeons. So we try to explain in a very easy way. You know, we use these dissectors to separate the medial from the anterior wall of the cavernous sinus. Then with this right angle knife, we can really open it widely. And I think this is a very important concept because you wanna open the medial wall of the cavernous sinus well so you can see the carotid artery. If you don't see the carotid, you're not gonna be doing a safe operation in my opinion. It's key to see the carotid. So then you can see the ligaments. You can get rid of these ligaments, the attachments, you can coagulate the inferior hypophyseal artery, such an important step. Then you can dissect the dura along the posterior clinoid, and then you can transect the carotid ligament. And when you transect it, you can remove the middle wall completely. And at the end, what you see is the naked posterior clinoid 
with the interclonal ligament attached to it, uh, you have removed the proximal ring, you just see the distal ring up here, and then you see the whole carotid and the clean cavernous sinus. And that is the goal in our operation, to get a clean cavernous sinus. I'm gonna show you a couple of examples. Uh, this is a virgin cushions case, not operated before. This uh, young kid, you see the tumor is adjacent to the wall of the cavernous sinus. So here we go, remove the tumor adjacent to the middle wall of the cavernous sinus, but I know there is more tumor inside and the tumor is inside the wall. So I open the cavernous sinus widely and look at how thick this wall is right here. All this is wall of the cavernous sinus right here and it's thick, full of tumor. So again, we cut the dura along the posterior clinoid. Then I have opened the cavernous sinus widely so you can see the carotid artery and I can start detaching the tumor from the carotid artery. And here we see the inferior hypophyseal artery. We coagulated, we transected. Now I'm dissecting along the posterior wall of the cavernous sinus. And finally, just cutting this attachment to the CCL superiorly, and I can move the tumor completely. And just putting the CCL attachment superiorly. And at the end, posterior clinoid here, carotid completely naked here, CCL cut, clinical space up here, and pituitary gland. And this patient has an immediate positive one remission. And she is going to be long-term region very, very likely. She's now one year out with no recurrence, excellent outcome. And, you know, as you get more experience, you start seeing more and more cases. This kid, he was from a different country, from Lebanon, had previous operations. He consulted with multiple surgeons and they told him that you don't need an operation. You, this cannot be cured. But I look at the MRI and they see something right here. Some people want to do bilateral adrenalectomy. Some people are going to do radiation. Some people say I can do surgery, but the chances for recurrence, for remission, I mean, is very, very small. But I know where that tumor is. And you just saw in that virgin case um, where that tumor was. So I'm going to do the same thing, but this is a recurrent case or a residual tumor, not recurrent, residual tumor. The first thing, I expand my approach all the way to the uh, cavernous sinus. And I open the anterior wall of the cavernous sinus really widely. This is so important. As we open this really widely, I can identify the carotid because right now this is tumor, but I'm not sure this is tumor. And what is the carotid? It's just lateral to it. So first I disconnect again, medially. So I expose the whole posterior climate. Then I start finding my carotid artery just lateral to the tumor. You see, this is carotid right here. And all this again is a thick layer of tumor embedded in the middle wall and embedding the cavernous sinus. So we need to do the same operation, gradually detach the tumor, from the carotid artery and cutting now here the um, dura at the floor of the cavernous sinus. You see the inferior parasitic ligament, very nice ligament right here. Looks like the sixth nerve, but it's not. It's the ligament, right? And then we cut the artery, we cut the attachment superiorly. We cut the attachment now laterally to the carotid artery and we can remove the tumor completely. And this patient, you can see the drop on the cortisol. And now this patient is now back to having a healthy life and cure for necrosis disease. So this technique has actually revolutionized how we operate and how we approach tumors in the cavernous sinus. And I've seen this more and more often. This patient from out of state in the US has this tumor been removed somewhere else, but they left the tumor in the cavernous sinus, actually embedded in the middle wall. So I can actually, this patient has acromegaly. This is so common in acromegalic patients. I can go into the middle wall of the cavernous sinus and remove the tumor completely. And this tumor, this is removed and the patient is in remission with normal IGF-1 level. So this is a life-changing operation. Some tumors, as you know, they are more invasive. They go into the cavernous sinus, multiple compartments. And we publish about this, we talk about this, but we continue increasing our expertise in removing tumors in the cavernous sinus. Even cases that before I did not think we were able to achieve remission. Uh, this patient, for example, a NOS4, all cavernous sinus compartments embedded, even the lateral compartment, we can achieve remission. We still have to see the long-term outcomes. If I have uh, some doubts about the long-term remission rates, uh, but for this, a year after, still in remission. Cases like this, another case operated somewhere else, out of state, uh, in the other coast, in the East Coast, right? And then you see this patient has this very large tumor, but unfortunately, you just did a rebulking of the middle portion of the tumor. They put a, they put a fat graft, the left tumor on both cavernous sinus, and the supracellular space, they start medication. 
And the medication brings the levels down some, but still the patient is very symptomatic. He has maximal, maximal medical therapy and he has all this tumor. Actually has dropped right here, but it's stuck to the brain, to the optic apparatus, both cavernous sinus. Again, this patient was told it is impossible to remove your tumor completely. You need a craniotomy to remove the supracellar, but the cavernous sinus cannot be touched. And you're going to have to need, radi you're, we're gonna need radiation um, and medication. So then we go into surgery. This is a very difficult operation. Just the exposure is very difficult. And then there is a lot of scar, but still you can find the anatomy. You're working through a lot of scar, but you can find it. This is the cavernous sinus. The carotid artery is being completely exposed. And now this is a unique case because the tumor goes into the clinodal space. And I can open the clinodal space. In this case, the ventral one. I open, I work lateral to the carotid into the clinoid and I can remove all the tumor. It's a suckable tumor. I can remove it. I just clean the contralateral cavernous sinus. And now I'm going to the supracellular space where the tumor is soft, but it's very sticky. And it's called, it, it has what is called uh, subarachnoid invasion. And this makes surgery so much more difficult. And you can see how the tumor is not respecting the planes, is encasing perforating vessels. See how we very gently try to preserve all perforating vessels. You see that's a small perforating vessel going to the optic chasm or optic tract. I very carefully preserve it. And I remove the membrane. Uh, and you need to use a combination of sharp dissection, not just blunt. And this is at the end of the resection with really difficult uh, planes, but preserving all neurovascular structures, complete tumor resection. You can argue whether it is microscopic disease, but for the most part, there is no gross disease left. And this patient is already in remission with normal IG1 level, no diplopia, not even uh, some partial sickness, nothing and uh, complete tumor resection doing excellent uh, to this day. Um, so we do more and more of these complex cases in the cavernous sinus. So results, although these are, this is a bit outdated because it's from last year, continue being very similar. I haven't had any injury to the carotid artery and that's because I am very, very careful doing these operations. It takes me a long time to do these dissections of the carotid artery. You have to be very careful. There is no other way to do it and you have to rely on your technique and all the anatomical landmarks. There are still some cases with double vision post-op, but there are very few, less than 5% will get double vision and all of them to this date have uh, improved and become normal at three to six months after the operation. Similarly, your remission rates in acromegaly, we need to update it too because this is almost a year old, but they are excellent with over 90% remission rate just with surgery and all our patients um, if they're not in remission, they will be with medication or radiation combination. Um, in this second part, I also want to show you some new advancement we've made, we've made on the anatomy of the, um, let's say, central skull base and transclival approaches. Um, we were working up here in the cavernous sinus. We're going to start working in this area here, okay? And then in the clival region, petroclival region, such an important area for us to understand. Um, as you remember, we divided this in upper... Um, middle and lower clivos, the upper clivos from the relos canal above, from the relos canal to the floor of the sphenoid. We can say the foramen lacerum is the mid clivos and below nasopharyngeal clivos is the lower clivos. Um, you see this illustration you see here, it took us, you know, many months of work to gradually make this illustration as accurate as possible. And I do believe that this illustration has so much power to educate neurosurgeons and skull based surgeons on the anatomy. Because this dissection is more difficult to understand, but here I want to show you three very important landmarks. First one, the palatosphenoidal artery. This palatosphenoidal artery behind the sphenoid process of the palatine bone, it has its own canal, and you need to identify this artery in order to then find the median nerve and the median canal that is just lateral to it. I'm going to show you a video showing this. So. This is the first landmark, palatus phenidal artery, important to identify for finding median. The second landmark, um, the pterygosphenoidal fissure, such an important landmark. This landmark is, is a fibrous tissue layer that is between the floor of the sphenoid right here, not clival bone yet, floor of the sphenoid, and the pterygoid bone, okay? And you see this pterygosphenoidal fissure you can see the dissection really well, forms approximately a 45 degree angle with the median nerve. And you can follow it from inferior to superior by drilling in between 
you know, the floral desphenoid on one side, the pterygoid on the other side. And this pterygoid sphenoidal fissure, the importance of it is going to take you directly to the foramen lacerum where the carotid is located. And exposing the carotid at the foramen lacerum is so important for many of the tumors we do here, chondosarcomas, chordomas, even some adenomas and other tumors. And it's difficult. It took me years to understand how to really expose the, the foramen lacerum reliably. And this technique is really very safe. And the third landmark, the petrosal process of the sphenoid bone. Is this piece of bone that belongs to the sphenoid bone, just at the bottom of the, at the base of the posterior clinic, it comes this uh, bony prominence right here that is gonna articulate with the petrous apex laterally. And this bone has dural, a dural layer covering it. This petroclival dura has the sixth nerve just on the other side, just above it. And this is the beginning of the Durellos canal. So this is the key landmark that I use to find the sixth nerve at the Durellos canal. It's just behind the choroid artery. And if you look at the illustration, you can see this is the petrosal process right here. And then articulates with the petrous bone. And the sixth nerve is located right here. So you have to gently mobilize the choroid artery as within the dissection. And then you will find the sixth nerve right here. And sometimes we don't see it in surgery. We just use an electrical stimulator to tell us confirm, yes, that is where the sixth nerve is located. And then you can remove everything that is around it, but at the same time, you preserve the sixth nerve. So these are the three landmarks. I'm gonna show you in some cases how to apply these landmarks, okay? This first case is a young patient in his uh, 20s with this large uh, mass that is compatible with a clival cordoma. First thing, we are covering the palatus fenidal artery. That's the key so I can get all the way to Vidian. And now, I. I find the pterygoid sphenoidal fissure right here, this tissue. I do it on both sides. And then I fracture the bone. I can expose completely the choroid artery at the foramen lacerum. Now I'm going to the other cavern of sinus. Here we need the anatomy of the ligaments we just described. We open it widely. And you see that's the inferior, para, uh, inferior paraceral ligament, the inferior hypophysial artery, the same anatomy on the other side. I'm doing this because this tumor is embedded into both cavern of sinuses. I'm taking one posterior clinoid, and I'm start worrying about the sixth nerve in this side, but this tumor is more invasive in this side. So I start identifying this. This is the petrosal process and actually has tumor on it. So I shrink the choroid artery periosteal layer, and I this gives me some more access. I can drill some of the tumor, and I start removing tumor that is located at the Rolos canal. I see this dural fold. In fact, this thing you see here, that is Gruber's ligament. And I can clean this very effectively by removing what is left of the petrosal process, I stimulating, I find the sixth nerve, and I know where I can resect. Finally, we take all the tumor. We can see the sixth nerve going in. And this is uh, the post-operative view with a complete tumor resection. This patient got a sixth nerve palsy post-op, but at three months, is all completely recovered. Another case, um, this is a very large chondrosarcoma. Um, and uh, you see it's involving the petroclaval fissure and going into the petrous bone and growing intradurally a lot and presents again with a six nerve palsy, not complete, partial. What is the six nerve here? Well, the petrosal process is gonna give us the answer, okay? In this case, because the tumor is so large and so lateral, I'm gonna combine it with a transmaxillary approach, what you call the CTM, contralateral transmaxillary approach, allows me to get deeper in the petrous bone, all the way to the internal acoustic canal and drill all the abnormal bone. So I use it for large chondrosarcomas like uh, like this one. So uh, again, um, same anatomy. We just go with the artery, palatus phenoidal. I find the median nerve, which I coagulate and transect, and then I can drill the whole pterygoid and get all the way back to the foramen lacerum. Find the pterygoid sphenoidal fissure, which you see right here. I can expose the carotid at the um, uh, foramen lacerum and cavernous sinus above, map it completely, and then I can remove all this tumor that is towards the petrous apex, that is the top of the petrous apex. You see all this tumor towards the middle cranial fossa. I can remove all. And then I transect the uh, pterygosphenoidal fissure to free up the choroid artery. I can expose the whole petrous choroid artery doing that technique. And now I start going into dural. And what is my sixth nerve? So you see this dural fold, this dural fold, and this bone right here. This bone is the petrosal process going to the petrous apex. What is left of it? I know the sixth nerve is going to be just behind. So I can continue removing tumor intradurally. And uh, you see there is a lot of tumor that I have to remove carefully. 
You see that dural fold? That is my sixth nerve, the S behind. It stimulates actually well. And you can see how thin the sixth nerve is in the brainstem. Super thin by the tumor. And this is our vascular uh, uh, flap. You can, so that you can see the ICG is very well vascularized. And our, our multi-year reconstruction for this patient. And this patient actually has an improvement of his sixth nerve uh, palsy um, um, and a complete tumor resection, no need for radiation, no um, CSF leakage, um, excellent outcome. And uh, another case, and I believe the last one I'm going to share with you, this is the, um, uh, the post-op on this patient, but this is the next case where we have this very large mass. You see it goes all the way from the, uh, you know, uh, petroclival region down along the uh, carotid canal in the parapharyngeal space. So this raised concerns for being a uh, um, carotid canal tumor. This is a rare entity, but this patient presents with a six nerve palsy again. And uh, so the steps are the same. In this case, I'm going to combine with a trans approach. I'm going to collaborate with my head and neck colleague. He's going to open the neck so he can dissect the lower part of the tumor. And simply, he's going to separate from the carotid and he's going to push it up so I can remove the tumor completely from an endonasal uh, approach. Um, you see here, again, same. Palatus finidal artery. I can mobilize the trigopath in fossa. I can find the median nerve which is right here. And I'm gonna coagulate and transect the median nerve, as you see right there. I like to do this uh, transposition of the pterygopath in fossa with this little stitch. You can mobilize the pterygopath in fossa out of your way. And I can follow the median nerve all the way back to the foramen lacerum using the same technique. Pterygopathal fissure, you saw it. Allows me to expose the carotid right here. You see the thick, thick tissue, pterygopathal. I can expose carotid at the foramen lacerum. Once you have the coronary foramen lacerum, everything is easier. Now I have transected the foramen lacerum tissue so I can go underneath in the infrapetrous route to this tumor. I can dissect the tumor off the dura. I can continue transecting here the foramen lacerum tissue below the coronary artery. And this gives me great access to the tumor. And this actually is many, many hours of work. This tumor was very fibrous. And I have to remove it in a piecemeal fashion. But finally, it can start removing the tumor. And this is the last piece of tumor that is coming from the neck, from the parapharyngeal space, because we dissected from below. And this at the end of the resection, no leak. We know the sixth nerve is actually up here, where I see the dural fall of the petrosal process. And this patient had a, a resolution of his sixth nerve palsy um, early after the operation, actually. And a, not a complete resection. I think that I left a bit of tumor that was very stuck to the coronary artery, but a near complete resection with a very good outcome for uh, this patient. This was a neurofibroma combined or mixed schwannoma neurofibroma, we think is the, of the sympathetic plexus of the carotid canal. Funny enough, he had a pupillary change, probably asymptomatic from cutting the sympathetic nerves in the, uh, in the carotid canal. Um, so in conclusion, I wanted to share with you today some of the new progress we're making in our understanding of endoscopic scolvis anatomy and technique starting with the clonodal space, ventral and dorsal, and the importance of the CCL ligament, the middle wall resection technique, we keep evolving and getting better at it and helping more and more patients with functional tumors that have tumor embedding it. Um, as we said, we improve our outcomes. Also for tumors with wide invasion to the cavernous sinus, many of them have been operated somewhere else. We can actually help those patients with more aggressive surgery to achieve complete resection. Remember, we keep using, of course, our transcavernous posterior canalectomy technique, so important for cavernous uh, invasion uh, in uh, chordomas and chondosarcomas. And the uh, anatomy for the exposure of the foramen lacerum, so efficient. Uh, we use it so often in our cases. And also, these newer landmarks for identification and better preservation of the Duchenne's nerve in these petroclival tumors. Remember, mastering surgical neuroanatomy is the key to safe, gentle, and accurate surgery. Thank you very much.